Welcome uh, to our uh, webinar on the African American Transfer Tipping Point Study. Uh, today, we're going to be sharing results from a survey that we did with uh, over 7,000 African American and Black students here in the California Community College system. And then we uh, will hear from a, a panel of experts uh, and uh, have them answer some questions uh, specifically about uh, these findings. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Next slide. So for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, the Research and Planning Group for California Community Colleges, otherwise known as the ARCD Group, we are an independent nonprofit and we do research and professional development in support of the a California Community College System, and we are also uh, the membership organization for the researchers and planners that work uh, across our system. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start uh, very briefly with where uh, this project got its uh, impetus, which was our original Through the Gate project. And so in this project, we wanted to look at uh, students who had seemingly completed all or most of their transfer requirements, but had not uh, transferred. And so again, focusing on our students uh, at the, in the at the gate, which again are students who maybe completed an ADT or um, they have at least 60 units with a 2.0 and they have finished their transfer level English and math requirements and our students that are near the gate who are uh, have the 60 units and the 2.0, but they have not completed transfer level English and math. So we wanted to understand kind of that, that landscape and this transfer continuum of, of who, who is transferring and all of those kind of stages uh, all the way to that transfer achievement. Next slide, please. So we had many, many findings from this study, but the, the one finding uh, that we wanted to uh, dig a, a little bit more into was that when we look at, again, those kind of those first three groups, the transfer achievers, the at the gate and the near the gate students, when you just look at those groups, uh, again, those, that group of students that have met all or most of their requirements, African American and Black students are were more likely than any other group to actually transfer, um, more likely than than White, Asian, uh, Latinx, Hispanic, everyone. And so, it, knowing that um, in in most cases when we look at transfer from a, a point of view of a, tracking a freshman cohort to transfer, African American students are are not. Uh, among the highest, and uh, when we measure the transfer rate like that, we wanted to know what's happening. What is that tipping point to where African American students become the most likely to transfer? Um, so that that is really the impetus for the the study that we're uh, sharing with you today, uh, the African American transfer tipping point study. So, which has been generously funded by uh, Lumina Foundation. We're very appreciative for their partnership and their support. Next slide, please. We are also really grateful. We want to give a, a shout out to our advisory committee, some of whom uh, you will meet later uh, in this webinar um, be, to be sharing, but this is the, the group uh, that um, has been really supportive this whole time and get, again, lending their expertise uh, and knowledge to our study. Next slide, please. So when we entered this study, these were our basic, our, our questions. What are those factors that is uh, that are affecting students' likelihood of trans transferring? What is happening, again, between essentially zero units and 60 units where the fortunes change? Um, and then looking more specifically at what kind of programs and practices are really uh, associated with uh, increasing that student's likelihood of uh, transferring. Next slide. So to go about it, our study really had three phases. We started with looking at the extant data, uh, you know, around students' uh, courses, their demographics, you know, all the information basically that we could get that already existed in the uh, Chancellor's Office uh, MIS or a management information system, the information that all the colleges send to uh, the Chancellor's Office. Uh, so we started there. And then we did some interviews and focus groups with uh, both practitioners and students at uh, some of the colleges where when we looked at the data, we saw that they were having um, a higher level of success in transferring 
African American and Black students. And then uh, we presented that information and we'll give you links uh, or QR codes at the end to, to get the information on those reports. And we're going to share that information very briefly here because it sets up the information about uh, phase three, which is that survey that I mentioned that we did uh, with Black students across the state. Next slide. So again, phases one and two, we looked at what are those factors that, that we could you know, see again in the data and from talking with students and practitioners. So next slide, uh, that the data that we looked at is we looked at first time student cohorts uh, and we tracked them for a period of six years. And to, to be in the cohort, the student will have completed at least 12 transferable units with a passing grade, but had not yet transferred uh, to a university. And so in that, that group, we found not quite 70,000 uh, Black students, and then the comparison group is just a bit under 800,000 of non-Black students. So the key findings from that basically were that uh, transfer, passing transfer level English and math in the first year was the most influential factor on, on whether a student was um, going to transfer. And by if a, and this is comparing black students who did to black students who didn't. So this is in comparing within uh, black students. So not comparing them to any other group. But when you compare a black student who did complete transfer level English and math in their first year to black students who did not, uh, they their chances of transferring increased by over three hundred percent. And I know that sounds like a really big number because it is it basically increase, it quadruples their, their chances. Uh, the next one there is transfer level math. It's more than doubles their chances. 100% basically means doubling of your chances. So 160%, uh, if they only have math, 70%, if they only complete English, again, in that first year. Uh, Black students who receive academic counseling, 60% more likely. Black students who participate in, Mo in Omoja, shout out to my Omoja uh, people. 20% uh, more likely. And so those are all wonderful and positive, but we did find some things that uh, are obstacles and challenges of students who are low income, right? They may be getting a Pell Grant or, or other kind of financial aid. Um, this doesn't, the, it, they're 20% less likely to transfer. And obviously it's nothing inherent, you know, about the student. It's more about their circumstance. It's, it's, it is much more challenging to complete, to transfer, to, to get an education uh, when you don't have resources. Um, just, just leads to a lot of, of challenges there. Similarly with uh, DSPS, our Disabled Student Programs and Services, again, it's not, it's not the student, it's the circumstance. Uh, these students have challenges that uh, students who do not have a disability don't, don't, may not have. And so it just may, means it's much more challenging uh, for them to uh, complete their educational goals. The other one there at the bottom, the 70% uh, means that any a student put on probation at any time in their um, uh, time at, in the community college, uh, their chances decrease by 70% um, of transferring. And that is that is significant. That is a substantial amount because uh, looking at this chart, the, the blue arrows that go to the right, they can go as high as basically infinity. You know, they can be a thousand percent, 10,000 percent, it, it could happen. The, going to the left there, the negative can only go to a hundred percent because you can only be either likely to do it or not likely to do it. <laughs> there isn't like, you can't be like three times less likely to do it. You're either just likely to do it or you're not likely to do it. So the fact that you max out at a hundred percent and this is 70 is significant. So student, Black students on probation are being severely in, inhibited um, in terms of meeting their goals. Next slide, please. Two things we do want to point out that we, some differences. One, when we looked at these same factors for all the other students, uh, the non-Black uh, students, uh, one that most of these were very similar with the exception of counseling. Um, for non-African American and Black students, receiving counseling uh, more than doubled their chances of getting, um, uh, of going ahead and transferring. And so there's there's a question there. 
And we're going to dig into that a little bit uh, with the survey findings, but of what might be pointing to that difference and also with our panel. And then the other one to point out is so it being on probation is devastating to a, ch a black student's chances, but you have to also factor in kind of this double effect in that black students are much more likely than all other students to get on probation in the first place. So there's there's kind of a compounding of this effect. So that's phase one. That and and uh, and some of, of phase two is is on the uh, the slide where the interviews and the focus groups kind of helped us contextualize some of these findings. And basically, you know, the math and English finding really points to faculty and the key role they play in whether students are able to get through the, those gate, gateway and gatekeeper courses in math and English. So recognizing the important role of faculty. Similarly with counseling, we asked students why may counseling, why are black students maybe not benefiting from counseling as much as uh, their peers? And the students kind of shared that they didn't really feel uh, welcome. They didn't feel heard. They didn't feel seen in, in many of our counseling and transfer centers uh, at, across the state. Um, Emoja, they pointed specifically to, to the counseling, having that dedicated counselor who knew you, that asked about more than just academics, that, that cared about you as a person, and then also just the community that comes with being in the Emoja program and of a community of peers, of faculty, of staff that are all there for your success. And then finally, uh, recognizing that the word probation is very triggering, especially if you have been just as impacted and that we um, we need to change that uh, for sure. And that it, it obviously affects your ability to continue because your financial aid is in jeopardy. And if you need that financial aid to go to school, it's like a vicious cycle. So that's, again, where we kind of came from with phase one and phase two. So what we're going to share with you today is what we've learned in phase three. And we specifically are we're digging deeper into those four um, areas. So if we go to the next slide, I think this is where I hand it off. All right, great. So to what Darla was saying, you know, we conducted these focus groups and interviews and got some really valuable insights in phase two. And then we thought, okay, well, let's kind of test this out on the larger scale. Let's go to students across the California community colleges and really dig in in these four key areas. So ultimately, we were thrilled to get responses from over 7,000 students. In that sample, 75% of them were currently enrolled at a California community college, and they were at various phases in their transfer journey. The majority of them had submitted applications and were waiting to hear back or were preparing applications. They were, they were ready to roll. 13% of the sample had already transferred to a university, and so that provided a really nice snapshot of their experiences looking backwards. And then another 13% had exited without transferring. And so we asked them, you know, were you ever planning to transfer in the first place? And more than half of them had planned to transfer at some point. And so those students were ones who had planned to transfer, but for whatever reason, they had exited or stopped out of the system. Okay, this is just to give you a very brief snapshot of who the sample was. We were thrilled to get responses from every single California community college, every credit bearing California community college, as well as a few of the non-credit colleges. Um, as we see in most surveys, it was 64% female, so skewed slightly more female than the overall population in the CCCs, but really a nice diverse sample with respect to age, financial status, first generation status. We had students participating in a wide variety of student programs from EOPS, to Emoja, to DSPS. And you'll see here actually 18% of students participated in Emoja, which was really helpful for this survey because we were trying to dig into some of the impacts of Emoja and really unpack that more. But just to note that 18% is higher than the overall sample across the California community colleges. It's more in the 10% range, but we had a nice sample size there. Okay. Now, before I dig into any of the results, I wanted to share that this survey was incredibly comprehensive. And in fact, we're not sharing everything from this survey today. We foresee a number of other pieces coming out of this, important findings being shared. For now, we really wanted to hone in on expanding on findings from phases one and two. So what we wanted to do was see how those four core student experiences, so that's 
passing transfer level coursework, receiving academic counseling, participating in EMOJA, and being placed on academic probation. We wanted to see how those four core student experiences intersected with other research frameworks that have told us are impactful for students' success, right? So one of the, the core frameworks we were looking at were, was building off of the RP Group Student Support Redefined work, and it's the six student success factors framework. And this idea that if students are able to identify with each of these six factors, they'll be more successful. So you can see them listed here and the, their definitions, but essentially it's whether students feel directed, focused, nurtured, engaged, connected, and valued. So we had a set of questions asking students about these factors and then crosswalked it with those four student experiences. We also, in one of the uh, follow-up phases of Through the Gate, were able to develop a, what we call the framework for building students' transfer capacity where we identified four core factors that significantly influence whether a student successfully transferred. And you know, we, can, we can link to all of these later on, but these four factors include university affordability, school life balance, pathway navigation, and whether or not the student has a support network. And again, we found that these four core factors significantly influence the transfer trajectories of all students. So we wanted to see how these four factors in, intersected with the four student experiences from the tipping point study. And then last but certainly not least, drawing from others' research on microaggressions, we wanted to see how students' experiences with microaggressions impacted or influenced their experiences with each of those four uh, core student experiences. And so here you see the four core microaggressions that we focused on in this study. Um, there's The first is ascription of intelligence. So that is assigning a degree of intelligence to a person of color based on their race. Assumptions of criminality. It's assuming a person of color is dangerous, criminal, or deviant based on race. Second class citizening is when a white person is given preferential treatment over a person of color and pathologizing culture, which is the notion that the values and communication styles of the dominant or white culture are ideal. So we ask students a set of questions that said, how often in your time at your community college have you experienced each of these four types of microaggressions and then crosswalk that against their experiences um, with the four student experiences from phases one and two. So this is just setting you up in terms of explaining the types of questions that we asked on the student survey. And again, crosswalking it with these four core student experiences. So we're gonna go through them one by one and then really facilitate a robust discussion about these findings. So first, passing transfer level math and English. Darla already showed that if a student passes transfer level math and English in their first year, they're 310% more likely to make it at least near the gate, if not through. Math is a bit more predictive than English. Both are really important. So again, we asked students, how often did you experience each of those four types of microaggressions that we looked at on the previous slide? So students might have said that they never experienced any of the four because these are rolled up across the four. Maybe they experienced at least one of them once or twice, maybe at least one of them occasionally, or at least one of them on a regular basis. So first we crossed walk this with whether or not they passed transfer level English the first time they took it. And what you can see here is there's a little bit of variation, but generally speaking, no really tight relationship between these two variables, right? However, when we looked at the same relationship with math, we can see a very different picture here. So if you're looking at this light yellow bar here, you can see if a student indicated that they never experienced microaggressions on campus, among those students, 80% of them passed transfer level math the first time they took it, which is pretty on par with the English pass rates, which are historically higher than math. However, among students who experienced at least one of those four microaggressions on a regular basis, only 25% of them passed math the first time they took it. Okay. So again, there seems to be something really going on with math that's not necessarily going on when it comes to English. So we're going to dig into that when we have the discussion in a bit. All right, so now we want to talk a little bit about academic counseling. So in the focus groups, a lot of the conversation was around 
student identity, students not feeling seen, valued, nurtured by the academic counselors that they saw. Um, and so we asked students in the survey, during your time at the community college, were you ever able to, or have you ever been able to see an African-American or Black counselor, right? Um, and so what we found was, and, and then we also asked them, would you have preferred to see an African-American or Black counselor? Because we wanted to see if a preference was there as well. So we found that two thirds of African-American and Black survey respondents said that they would prefer to see an African-American or Black counselor, but only half were able to do so. And then we also saw that when we compared that smaller group of students who had already successfully transferred and compared them to students who left the system who were no longer CCC students, but who did not transfer, we found that 42% of the students who successfully transferred indicated that they had met with an African-American or Black counselor during their time at the community college compared to 33% among those who left without transferring. We also wanted to look at the relationship between counseling and the six student success factors that I was mentioning before. And so we crosswalked the frequency with which an African-American or Black student went to academic counseling and then we asked them, to what degree do you identify with each of these six student success factors? Now, these are all students who went to counseling at least once. So we looked at those who went once, twice, three times or more. And what you can see here is the more often a student indicated receiving academic counseling, the more likely they were to identify with each of the six student success factors, especially, you can see here, the degree to which they were focused. So you see regular counsel students who went to regular counseling had about a 20% higher likelihood of, of identifying with the success factor of feeling focused than students who did not. Now, you know, hearkening back to statistics 101, correlation is not causation, but we do see this pattern here that needs to unpack a bit more. And then when we were looking at the data for students who participated in Emotia, we saw a lot of crosswalking with their experiences with academic counseling. And what we saw was that students who participated in Emoja were a lot more likely to indicate that they went to academic counseling on a regular basis than students who did not participate in Emoja. And students who participated in Emoja were a lot more likely to indicate that they were, had been able to see an African-American or Black counselor than students who did not participate in Emoja. You see almost 80% of Emoja participants were able to do so. Yeah. And then if we look at this chart on the right, we asked students about connection and someone supporting their success. And what we found was that students who participated in Emoja were more likely to find a community where they feel like they belong at their college and to find someone who they feel supports their academic success on campus. And I'm not showing it here just for time's sake, but we also found that Emoja students were much more likely to identify with each of the six student success factors. And that intersects with some of these findings here in that they are able to find connection, belonging, and community on campus. All right, last but certainly not least, academic probation. So for this one, you know, we had a lot of conversations from phases one and two about the triggering nature of probation, about the way in which it impacts financial aid um, eligibility, and that can cause additional hardships that were already hard to begin with. And what we wanted to look at was this idea that academic probation, what we were hearing in the focus groups, is so much more than academics, right? And so we asked students who were currently, at the time of taking the survey, who are currently on academic probation, how much are each of those four factors from the transfer capacity building framework? How much of these are a challenge for you? And we compared students currently on academic probation to students who had never been put on academic probation. And so what you can see here is for each of the four factors, university affordability, school life balance, pathway navigation, and having a support network, students who are currently on academic probation were much more likely to say that each of these factors were a challenge for them relative to students never on academic probation. And you see the biggest gap here when it comes to school life balance. So then digging a bit deeper into students, you know, home, personal lives, we asked them a whole other set of questions that asked them about the challenges when it comes to mental health, when it came to the pandemic, when it came to basic needs. Um, we have 
access to necessary computer tools at home, one could argue that is also a basic need, and then access to helpful counselors and advisors. And what you can see here is the same pattern. Students who are currently on academic probation were much more likely than students who had never been put on academic probation to report a whole host of challenges in their daily lives that aren't specific to struggling with transfer level coursework. You know, of course, you see that here, and of course, it's very important, but one could argue that the gaps are just as large when it comes to mental health and pandemic related challenges, indicating that when it comes to probation and what is, you know, quote unquote, causing students to be placed on academic probation, it's a whole lot more than academics. All right, now is the fun part. I'm going to turn it back over to Darla, who's going to facilitate an engaging panel discussion. So I'm going to stop share so we can see everyone's faces and have a great discussion. Thank you, Katie. Ah, so good to see everyone. Um, I'm going to introduce you and then we're gonna kick off with our first question. So introductions in alphabetical order. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anita Bailey. I am the uh, Moja Coordinator um, Program Director um, for Emoja Community Education Foundation. It's a pleasure to be with you. Hi, I'm Michelle Fowles, Dean of Institutional Effectiveness at LA Valley College. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, Frank Harris III, Professor in the Community College Leadership Program at San Diego State and also uh, Co-Director of the Community College Equity Assessment Lab at San Diego State. Good to be here. Good morning, afternoon. My name is Marcel Gilmore. I'm a researcher at Mount San Antonio College. I'm also um, with the RP group, the vice president of professional development and membership, and happy to be with you today. Good morning, everyone. Aisha Lowe, executive vice chancellor in the Office of Equitable Student Learning Experience and Impact at the California Community College's Chancellor's Office. Pleasure to be here. All right, well, we're going to dive right in with um, our, our first question, which is uh, actually going to start where we ended looking at uh, academic probation. And so we saw that uh, students on academic probation were much more likely than students who never were on probation uh, to report a, a wide range of challenges in, in, our, in their daily lives. So what suggestions do you have for colleges trying to support students on academic probation before they get on probation, while they're on probation, and then after they get off probation to help them stay on? And so our first question, uh, we are asking uh, Dr. Lowe to get us started and then others will chime in. Well, thank you so much for that, Dr. Cooper. First, just want to thank the RP group for this study um, and uh, the, the wisdom that is illuminating in terms of both the positive uh, results uh, around things like transfer level English and math, around the work of important programs like Emoja, and then this result around academic uh, probation uh, that, frankly, as I looked at it, hurt my heart, uh, right? This felt like here again, we have an example of a structural feature of our institutions that is actually harming students um, and disproportionately harming African-American students. And it was particularly striking to me uh, in that graphic you all just showed today um, that students on academic probation are more likely to be the students who need the most support, right? The students who are navigating basic needs challenges, life challenges that we know hinders our students' progress. And so that really tells us that when a student falls behind, it is because they are facing real life challenges, right? It's not because they're not invested or they're not motivated, uh, right? Or they're not putting enough uh, work or effort into uh, their academic career, but they're facing real life challenges and pressures, and they're ultimately not getting the support they need. And then when we think about something like academic probation in the ways that we currently implement it in their most vulnerable time, instead of assisting them, we are criminalizing them for needing our help. So what do we do? I mean, frankly, when I think about 
these results, it feels to me that we need to reimagine this entire process uh, around academic probation. Um, and I think we would all agree, let's start by, with a name. Uh, I think one suggestion uh, that we would have for colleges and certainly work that we are happy to take on here at the state chancellor's office is for us to stop calling it academic probation. Um, it's amazing uh, to me that we're using criminal justice language in education. And I think we all have to think very carefully about why would we expect that such messaging would support or motivate students. It should it should be common sense to us that it would not, but thank you, RP Group, for making that clear with data and information, that no, that's not going to motivate students when we come with that messaging. So instead, I would recommend for our system that we implement a holistic, student-centered, and really client management approach to supporting students. So what does that mean before? Right. What preventative measures do we have in place to ensure that students are aware that there are a vast array of supports available to them on your campus? So how do we make sure that they're aware of those things and that's clear? I think another thing we can certainly do a better job of uh, preventatively, both in the classroom and on our campuses, is how do we get to know our students well enough? that we actually know what challenges they face so that we can collectively plan ahead together with them in partnership on how we will help them to mitigate those challenges. So for example, when I was in the classroom, I always gave my students an opening survey and I would ask them things like, are you working, uh, right? Are you working part-time or full-time? I would ask them directly, what challenges are you facing right now that might get in the way of you being able to fully focus. So then I could then have follow-up conversations with them about how I was gonna help them to mitigate those challenges. So I think we need those preventative measures. How do we make sure students are fully aware of the many resources available to them? How do we actually get to know them so that we know what their challenges are and that we can help mitigate them? And then how do we have, we, we have many early alert systems on our campuses, uh, but I feel like we can double down on that. So as soon as a student misses one class, as soon as they fail one assignment, how do we implement direct outreach to those students, right? Direct, personal, hands-on outreach to those students so that we can understand what is happening in their lives because it is likely something happening in their lives and what it is that they need. And if then for the during a student falls behind, let's not send them a message of probation, right? Slapping them on the head and communicating that they're deficient. But instead, how do we implement academic support interventions to help that student get back on track? Because maybe what they need is simply a bus pass, right? Or maybe they need to be aware of courses and programs that better fit their schedule. Maybe they need academic tutoring. Maybe they need a way and a process to confidentially and safely tell us that their classroom environment is not safe. And that's why they are disengaging. So how do we have all of those processes and procedures in, in place so that we can understand when a student is falling behind? How do we connect them with a MOJA, a MEN, right? Uh, EOPNS, Quinte, and the like to make sure that they're getting that hands-on support. And then afterwards, how do we maintain support? I think it's going to be important that we don't just have these short-term quick um, outreach or quick injections into a student's life and then we withdraw. How do we support them continually even after their performance improves um, as a way to show them that we have sincere care and investment uh, in their lives and in their futures? Thank you so much. That was, that was good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, anyone else want to chime in about uh, the soon to be renamed academic, academic probation? <laughs> Make yeah, sense. I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, a lot, lot, lots of wisdom uh, shared by Dr. Lowe as, as expected. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, the report also states that most students who find themselves on academic probation also indicated in the survey that the resources and support that they actually received wasn't really helpful in getting them off of academic probation, right? And this, this finding was particularly for students who were on academic probation and eventually were able to get off, right? So, you know, I think to Dr. Lowe's point, we really need to sort of reconceptualize this idea. We think about academic probation as strictly being an academic challenge, right? Or about, oh, the students can't necessarily do the work when it's much more than that, right? It's, it's, it's about, it indicates challenges in some other areas that tend to not necessarily be strictly academic in the way that we've, we've thought about it. And I also love the, uh, the recommendation and the suggestion of 
reconceptualizing and even renaming academic probation. Because I think the very, the very idea of calling it academic probation can trigger things like impossible phenomenon and stereotype threat, which we know when we think about how most students, uh, particularly Black students, experience our K through 12 system, right? It is often riddled with microaggressions and messages that tell them you're not smart, you're not capable, you're not college material, and so on and so forth. And even those students, um, even when students make the decision to enroll in college, those messages and some of those things that they that they've experienced still follow them, you know, as they matriculate into community college. And so we have to think about how does calling it academic probation trigger negative messages that ultimately uh, are detrimental to students' uh, efficacy and ultimately their long-term success. But um, yeah, that's some some quick thoughts there. We have time if one more person wants to chime in or we can go to the next question. I want to piggyback really quickly on what Dr. Harris said. I, th I think we need to pay um, a significant amount of attention to students and their K-12 experience because they don't arrive to our campus, you know, tabula rasa. They're not a blank slate. And they carry those experiences from K-12 onto our campus. So if we act as if they're not coming to our campuses with, with trauma sometimes or with um, Dr. Bettina Love would say spirit murdering, um, if we don't acknowledge that as a, as a possibility, then we're really doing a disservice to students. Um, so I, I think that has to be kept in mind. And a, a second point that Dr. Harris made about students not feeling that with academic probation that the support worked. I think we need to do a better job as um, in our respective institutions of evaluating our programs. Just because the doors are open and it has an intended purpose, does not mean it's doing a good job doing that. And so our programs need to um, maybe reach out to their research department and, and do an evaluative process and reaching out to students to seeing why um, the services may not have the intended benefit. Thank you for adding that. Um, I will shout out my colleagues at College of the Canyons who actually um, asked us at RP to help them do that exact evaluation of their um, um, uh, academic probation uh, program. And uh, it, it was, I think, very helpful for them to, to be able, because they had done a whole you know revamp of their program and they wanted to know, is, is we changed everything, is it working? And so I, I think they got some really positive feedback about it being more of what what uh, Dr. Harris and soon to be Dr. Gilmore uh, are uh, try, are saying in terms of these kinds of programs. So thank you uh, all of you for for that. I think I move on. It's okay to our next question, which is um, about counseling. So we heard that from these students that they a lot of them would like to be able to see uh, an African American or Black counselor. So aside from hiring more um, African-American and Black counselors, which I think we're all in support of, what else can colleges do to ensure that their African-American and Black students are having a positive and worthwhile experience as possible, regardless of the race of, of, of the counselor? Yeah, I think, uh, thanks for the question. Great question. Uh, it's, it's, we have the same issue with faculty too. Students would like to see more diverse faculty. And so I think it, it comes to, we need to walk and chew gum. Uh, we need to be able to create better pipelines to bring more people of color, specifically black counselors into the fold. Secondly, for those who are currently in their counseling role, we need to provide professional development in order to support them and especially dealing with their implicit biases. And I think that is such a key point because we are socialized in this country and we, and I am plural about the we, that black people in particular have, I don't know, an intellectual deficit. And so if you believe that, then sometimes you are going to dismiss 
some of the comments or couch it in a certain way. You know, I've just completed some focus groups with students, black male students, um, for my dissertation. And one of the things that came up is the fact that they, they would go and talk to a counselor about, hey, I'm interested to transfer to UCLA. And before the counselor even looked at their transcripts, they're kind of dissuading them like, oh, that's a tough school. You, may, you know, maybe you want to think about, you know, this school or that school. And then finally they look at the transcript. They're like, oh, oh, yeah, you are UCLA material. And it's like, did you not listen to a word? I said, why did you have to dismiss me when I first brought it up? But then once you looked at the grades, my transcripts, now you can kind of see that I have the ability. And so it's it's, it's things like that of getting past our, our microaggressions. But I think another key point would be that maybe there's a way that we can have some precursory elements of counseling that involve other um, members of our institution, that our staff and faculty who have degrees, who, who maybe know what it's like to, to pick a major, to think about a career, to maybe balance school and work. Um, maybe they know what it's like to deal with imposter syndrome or what it's like to feel like as a first generation college student, you may be leaving some of your friends behind and how awkward that is and how do you deal with that? And you don't have to be a counselor to have those experiences. Now, what that also does is it really creates nuance to the, the, the counseling visit now. Now we can talk about my ed plan. Now we can talk about any internship or any other opportunities I may have, because I'm not talking to you about, hey, I'm trying to figure out who I am and try to discover uh, what career I want to do. So some of those things can be done um, with a more broad um, support system on our respective campuses than just relying on the, on the counselor with their counseling load to take care of all of that. And so that's one of the, that's, those are just some of the things that we need to think about. Um, Cause we know that students, when they go to counseling more, right? They feel more engaged, they're more fo focused. Those things that, those attributes that we find that are so strong with being a successful student, they come about when there's that, that degree of engagement. I want to piggyback on that and just say that, you know, many of our campuses don't have a lot of Black counselors. And so we have to think about how we are supporting them because they're often tasked with doing more than counseling, right? So how it, it's, it's up to the institution to support the students. And that means supporting counseling and supporting the, the people who are intentionally serving um, Black students. So where these counseling spaces are happening for Black students, um, who's present? Are they showing that they care? Are they supporting the Black counselors? Because students see that also. And so they'll know this person is an ally. This person is committed. This person is present. They show up, you know, they're at our HBCU events, they're at these other things. And then they'll start to know, okay, this person isn't necessarily black, but they are a supporter of the black community. So I think that we have to also leverage that and not um, leave it up to, you know, the, the mighty few who have to carry carry the weight most of the time. So I, I wanna, you know, acknowledge that and call everybody out. Um, we have to ch change our institutions and it's not just about, um, you know, the number of, of counselors that we have. We want more, but we have to hold ourselves accountable as an institution. I can jump in on that one, Dr. Cooper. I think when, when we think about that reality, right, that we do not have, first of all, we don't have enough counselors, period, uh, within our system. I think our statewide average is something ridiculous, like one counselor to every over 500 students. Uh, and we certainly do not have uh, enough Black counselors. So we have to work on that. Um, but I, I wanted to underscore um, something that both Marcel and, and Michelle then said when Marcel talked about the training then of the, of the counselors that we do have. Um, I think that's so important that we have to remember 
that oftentimes that bias is implicit, right? And, and I think it's important for people to remember that, right? We're not talking about the counselor who's sitting in their office, literally thinking, oh, this black student is not good enough to go to UCLA, right? These biases are subconscious, they're implicit. So what is the kind of training that then is going to help an individual to recognize that and then, frankly, to compensate for that, right? What is the kind of training that's going to help an individual to understand the reality of the dynamic that's going to exist between you as a non-Black counselor with your Black student? How do you recognize the unspoken trauma that may be sitting in that room, right? How do you recognize the reality of what that student is carrying and really sort of the risk that student is taking when they walk into that space with you, the counselor has to be trained to understand those dynamics and to understand how they they overcompensate for the reality of those dynamics, the ways in which they're going to have to go above and beyond to create a safe environment for that student. And that's a different kind of training, right? So I think we, we need some investment there. And then I would say structurally, I'm going to say two things that might be controversial. Structurally, right, I saw a comment in the chat about how do we get more diverse individuals to apply to be counselors, might we need to look at the minimum qualifications for counseling so we can open up the doors there? I'm just going to throw it out there. Uh, that might be helpful. And then I love the, the idea also, Marcel, that you put out about how do we think about the role of advising, counseling, and frankly, coaching and expanding that beyond this is the role of a particular person. Uh, I would love to see faculty more highly engaged in that. I came from a four-year institution where that was a part of the faculty load, right? Faculty actually advised students very heavily, and it created this beautiful dynamic of relationships and connection between faculty and students on campus, and it was systematized right into the institution and a part of faculty load. And if I if I could offer two quick points um, to, to piggyback on what my colleagues have already shared. Um, someone is going to read this recommendation and say, hey, let's just go out and hire another Black counselor, right? And I think that's problematic for a couple of reasons. One, no one person can really carry the load that it takes to make sure that Black students are well supported within an institution, number one. Number two, we also know this is not a part of this study, but we also know that Black counseling faculty also experience a lot of the challenges, the racism, the racial microaggressions, the battle fatigue, all of the things that our students experience as well. And so for institutions that are looking to build their counseling capacity, particularly around counselors who, who have, um, you know, some lived, who share the lived experiences of our students, you got to make sure that they're well supported. You have to make sure you're creating an environment where they'll actually stay, where you can really leverage their expertise as African-American counselors. And then it's also making sure that everyone at the institution, everyone on the counseling faculty understands the lived experiences of Black students at that institution. And not assuming that what Black students are experiencing at Mount SAC is the same as what Black students are experiencing at LA Valley College. Yeah, there might be some shared experiences, but each institution is its own unique culture, right? And so regardless of the identity of any of the counseling faculty, everyone should know, hey, you know, what, what, are, what is our institutional data telling us about how Black students are experiencing our institution? And then the last, last quick point, we saw in the report, it looked like three contacts with a counselor was the tipping point, right? And so not thinking about this recommendation is, okay, make sure students have a contact with a counselor and they moved on. You could see once students, there was a big difference between students who saw a counselor two times and students who saw a counselor three times. There was a big jump in uh, you know, success and transfer rates. So kind of understanding that as well, I think is those are some important observations we, we unpack this recommendation. I wanted to jump in and add a couple of things. Thank you, Dr. Harris, for that. Um, it made me think about, and I'm gonna jump in and talk a little bit about Emoja, but I know we're gonna get to that later. But I think it's important that that point is brought up because when um, different college campuses see the effects of Emoja and what it does, um, I think it's important to realize that there's a small group of people that are holding the weight of supporting this mass amount of students that are meeting this transfer tipping point and getting them to their academic goals. And so I'm so glad that the conversation steers back to hold the institution responsible for making sure that 
even with special programming, that there are teams in place and that there is effective support and resources so these individuals can be able to adequately do what they need to do to serve students because this is hard work that we're doing. Um, and sometimes the question comes up is how do we replicate? Do we, how are we able to do this for the masses? It's very challenging to have that conversation because in order to serve these students the correct way, you have to give up yourself. Um, you have to give up your heart space. You have to give up time. It may not be in your roles and responsibilities. And so there's a level of accountability and a level of expectation that comes from the people that are serving these students. And typically when we're even talking about emotional programming, you may be talking about two people, three people that are doing this work to be able to carry. And when we, and what's really important to me in this work, we want to make sure that everything that we're doing through the researching, through the development of programming, that it's sustainable. It's not going to be sustainable if we have practitioners doing this work that can't survive this work um, because we're not working as a village to be able to execute what is necessary. And so even when it comes to general population and special programming, it has to come back to the institution to assess how is this program area able to carry this out? And are we providing adequate resources for them to do the work um, so that they're not overexerting themselves so they can continue to serve? And so I think that is really important that as we have this conversation that we take into account the well being of the folks that are doing the work um, so that they can serve the students and be there for them. Thank you all so much for that. That was super rich. I'm, I'm a since I'm hosting, I get to say something too. So I want to, I, I've said this in more than one space publicly, and I'm gonna say it here. And most of the time I repeat it because it bears repeating. Black students are not the sole responsibility of black faculty and staff. Did everybody hear me? Black students are not the sole responsibility of black faculty and staff. Uh, my, my sister Anita said, takes a village. It's not just the same, <laughs> it is reality. Number two, uh, I think everyone was kind of pointing at the, 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 the training for counselors and it really points to the need uh, for the implicit bias training that was mentioned, but I would add trauma-informed practice for both counseling and instructional faculty and classified professionals and administrators and anyone who is dealing with our students. Our students arrive with trauma. It's educational trauma, it's personal trauma, and trauma-informed practice needs to be just part of, of the training automatically, not an add-on, not a voluntary, like, oh, I, this sounds interesting, let me go to this session. We every, Everybody needs trauma-informed practice uh, training. And then finally, I'm, I'm, a, I'm in my shout-out mode, so I'm going to give a shout-out to a program called Pipeline to Possibilities uh, out of the Chancellor's Office. I uh, believe, I'm not saying that incorrectly. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, that is looking at this specific thing, this specific question about, well, there's not enough, right? There's not enough in the pipeline, which is, they could have a whole conversa conversation about that, but we're not going there. There are, are HBCUs are graduating black people constantly. There is a whole pipeline right there for instructional and counseling faculty, as well as administrators and any any of any and all of our positions. So that program, if you haven't, you don't know about it, look into it. That is is one way to do that is to uh, get and a lot of our there are a lot of students who come from California who go to an HBCU and are looking to come back and be pro a professional back at home. So that's my shout out. All right, now we're gonna get to my emoji. My, my, sorry, I just took like all ownership of Emoja. Okay, my, my, my Emoja. Uh, so again, we saw that the Emoja participants were more likely to to have community, to to have that sense of belonging, to 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 be connecting with uh, someone on the uh, on the college campus that supports their success. So what can, what practices can counselors, you know, instructors, our professors, and others? used to a, a term that we use in the emoji community, which is to emojify uh, their practice. So in, in the absence of an emoji program, or as Ms. Anita uh, talked about, can't cover, there's two, literally a lot of times it's two people. 
how can, in the absence of a program or lim the limited resources, how can we help other student support programs on campus help students feel the same way or something comparable to the way our Moja students feel? And so, obviously, Miss Anita is going to get us started on this one. I am. Now, you all know I love emoji and I'm passionate about it, so I'm going to be mindful of my time. But I think what's important is a lot of our work um, that was established by our founders was built on Dr. Bell Hook's teaching to transgress. And something that Dr. Bell Hook shares is that if we give our children sound self-love, they will be able to deal with whatever life throws at them. And I think that's important to take into consideration. And I know Marcel said it very well that our students are coming in through educational systems with layers of trauma. And what's happening is when they're coming into spaces such as Emoja, where someone is seeing them, hearing them, and taking the time to dig into their well being, that is being unpacked. And so what you see happening in Emoja is a holistic student development. What you see is that within a mojo that we're tapping into students' intellectual well being, their social well being, their spiritual well being. And so, in order for um, other programs, in order for other practitioners in this work to try to give a level of emoji experience, you have to deepen your relationship with the student. Um, you have to be able to see them and be able to tap in and understand what is happening in multiple areas of their life. Now, I have worked in emoji in multiple capacities, and I have had such relationships with students where they can tell me that they're okay, and I know they're not okay. Right, and it's that level of connection because you have a relationship, so you're asking the questions. When they're not showing up for class, you're, you're texting them, you're calling them, you're showing up. And so there is a level of intrusive counseling, intrusive program support, our students are experiencing that make them want to stay, right? Make them want to continue because they have a partner, a coach in this process of them trying to attain their goals, which is highly important. And that's what we see happening, you know, so often in Emotia. Um, the other thing that is important to assess is how are we making the curriculum, the content, the way that we facilitate relevant to the students' cultural and realistic experiences? How do we incorporate that into the classroom? How do we incorporate that into the conversations? And the emotion program is very much so rooted in the connection to the African diaspora. And so our students are having opportunities not only to advance their intellect to get them to their goals, but they're also tapping into unserved spaces within themselves about owning their Black identity understanding truths and realities about who they are and who they can be and having role models and genders in their presence to be able to help nurture them through. Something I like to say about Emoja is, we're not just with you with your first year. Once you join Emoja, we're with you indefinitely, you know? And, and when you come in, when you're at the community college, we're there until you hit your goal. If that is one year, two year, three years, years, we are going to continue to support you until you get to that space. And so when you think about the, the best practices to be able to emotify in a way, connect to the content if you're faculty. Look at how you are serving and facilitating. How are you evolving what you, how you are connecting your concepts to the generation that you are serving? How are you making relationships and connecting to students so you understand them just outside of the number that they're given when they apply to your college? How do you know them, understand them, their experiences and things that they bring to the table? Because when students come into the classroom, and that's a key concept, a student is going to come to the class, whether it's virtual or in person. They may not necessarily come to student services. They may not necessarily find out about different programs that exist on campus, but they're coming to your class. They're interacting with faculty. And so in that interaction with faculty, how are we then making sure that the students feel like this is a safe space for them, that there is a connection, and that we're understanding who they are? So I think there's so many different facets that we have to take into consideration. And the way that Emoja does that is we, it creates safe space 
spaces for students where they feel like there's a sense of belonging, there's a community on that campus, and there's accountability. And there's a, a team of folks, whether it's two people, one person, four people, or other stakeholders on that campus that know and care and provide access and resources for our students, which is really important. And I can't say it enough, that relationship. I had a student once before that was in the Moja program and we were sitting having some conversation and there's many times I've been very emotional and, and, and have had moments with students. And what she shared was that not even my family treats me the way you all do in Emotion. They don't recognize me, they don't see me, but here you hear me, here you celebrate my wins with me, here you encourage me. And so it's so much deeper and those, those seeds that are planted create roots for our students to wanna stay um, and be able to thrive and you know, uh, end up achieving these goals that they have for themselves, which I think is really important. Uh, I just wanted to add to that. So if you don't have an emoji program, I think those principles still hold true. So, you know, for many campuses, before we had emoji programs, we were doing this work. And so some of the points that were made is that you have to see Black students from an asset-based, you know, mindset. Um, and I think the last principle um, in the emoji practices, if you're not familiar with them, look them up. So that's step one, uh, is that it's everybody's business, uh, whether you have a program or not. Um, and that accountability that comes with emoji is something that we should be um, integrating in our institutions, whether we have an emoji program or not. It's everybody's business to have Black students succeed, and we should all be invested in that. And so it's not just about the Moja funding, it's not just about the equity funding, it's about all of the funding because we have to put resources behind the outcomes that we want to achieve. And I think that's the one thing that um, is really sort of um, unique to the Moja is that it gives you that structure for holding the institutional accountable, holding the institution accountable. But you can start that even if you are not, if even if you are not an Moja. Uh, campus. So it is everybody's everybody's work, whether you have a Mosier or not, we want to see Black students succeed. And so the other thing that I want to say is whether you have a space or not, where are your Black students present on campus? Um, and who is there? Who is supporting them? Um, we have folks, you know, since especially since 2020, who've been doing a lot of ally training, and they're saying that they're out there and they're supporting us. Are you in those spaces supporting Black students? in the classroom, outside of the classroom. So show up where you can with whatever skills that you can, do what you can um, to render black students visible um, and to, to celebrate them um, from an asset perspective. Thank you so much, Anita and Michelle, uh, what you two are illuminating. And it gets at this, this ideological issue, not just on our campuses, but in higher ed. Can we push against this Western European, frankly, white supremacist ideology of rugged individualism. That's really what we're pushing against. Can we shift to an ideology that this, inter this academic enterprise is with people? It is therefore relational and there has to be sincere love and care. And I think that's part of the dynamic and the battle that we wrestle with on our campuses is being okay with thinking about the academic enterprise, the process of teaching and learning differently than what has traditionally been handed down to us, right? That this is this very sterile, impersonal exchange of information. There are rules and requirements and you either meet them or not, right? How do we have a complete ideological shift that this is in a relational exchange with human beings and core to that exchange being effective is love and sincere care would have to be at the center of it. And I think, uh, Anita, you so beautifully described exactly what that looks like in action in the work that Emoja is doing. Ethic of love, like, like uh, the soon to be Dr. Powell said, um, those 18 Emoja practices, look them up, but they all are centered around the ethic of love and whether we love our students. Do you really love our students. Okay, the last question uh, was about the microaggressions and the negative association with passing transfer level math. 
uh, it, on that first attempt. So just generally, uh, I think we're going to start with Dr. Harris, but was there anything uh, about this finding that was surprising, not surprising, and why might we be seeing the difference between English and math uh, in, in the terms of the relationship with microaggression? Yeah, th thank you, Dr. Cooper. Um, not surprising. I think we know that um, Black students' experiences in math has always been racialized, right? Even, you know, again, uh, not to not to point the finger at our, our K-12 colleagues and partners, but, you know, many of our students tell us, I, I struggled with math in high school. I'd never had a good experience. I was, you know, never thought I was good at math. And so sometimes, right, we, we, we sort of bring those same perspectives, right, self-defeating, you know, sort of thoughts and perspectives with us into our community college and, you know, into our sort of post-secondary experience. And so, um, you know, again, when we think about what happens in math, one, you know, one negative experience, one negative message, right, however large or small it is, can again kind of trigger some of those, those, those past thoughts um, and past experiences that make students feel like, you know, I'm not going to make it. This is not for me. Let me let me get out of this. Right. Um, we, we have very few colleagues, um, you, you know, very few of our, our math colleagues. I want to be careful with how I frame this. But the whole idea of creating a cultural, cultural uh, relevant and, and culturally affirming experience, that's something that, you know, is, is probably more present, you know, within our English context than it is in our math context, right? And so I think that's why we, we often see some differences. Uh, you know, we see the differences in terms of that particular finding around, you know, how, do, how does experience a racial microaggression in English, why do we see it not necessarily having the same impact on success in English that we do in math? And I think a lot of it is because math being this, this, this racialized experience um, and where things like ascription of intelligence right and you know pathologizing culture tend to be a lot more salient within the math context than it is within our within the context of english and this is not to say that that it, we have it all figured out in english we that there could be challenges in english as well but i think the whole you know the whole concept of you know being a culturally relevant and culturally affirming math educator right that that is not as not as widely embraced as it is within the context of English, right? And then even, even the idea of, you know, what is the faculty, what does faculty representation look like, you know, in math and English? We're probably much more likely to see black faculty representation in English than we are in math. And again, it's not to say that we don't have the capacity and the capability to be math uh, educators, but we experience a lot of the things that our students experience in making decisions about, you know, what it is that we're gonna do, what do we wanna teach, where do we where do we want to invest our efforts? Where do we want our professional lives to be and look like? Would be my, you know, sort of um, quick response to 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 a very nuanced and complicated finding. Well, we do have five minutes. If anyone else wants to chime in on this one from their observations. I know I feel like I'm talking too much, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Oh. Uh, just <laughs> doubling down on on what Dr. Harris just said, I, I think um, we do see in math in particular, right? Sort of this ideology I was just talking about, right? Sort of this ideology of elitism, right? This ideology of you know you you either deserve right to to do well here or you don't. We see that in a lot of math in the sciences. So I think there's definitely work to be done. Uh, for how do we shift for our math faculty, for our math departments, their own identity and understanding of who they are, right? And what their role is. There's a strong history in higher education of gatekeeping around math and science. That is very intentional, all right? I remember when I was an undergrad, you know, they were called the weeder courses. Uh, and the whole purpose and concept 
was uh, for them to be exceptionally difficult uh, and not very supportive of students. So you could quote unquote, weed students out. So you gotta push against that whole concept, that ideology, that belief that that's appropriate, that that's necessary. Um, and as opposed to that notion, how do we really frame for those who are in math, those who are in STEM, this understanding of how desperately we need math and STEM students in this state so that we can fulfill the STEM careers of the future, so that California does not fall behind, and so that the United States does not fall behind, how do we then inculcate within our math faculty the very important role, and our STEM faculty, the very important role they can play for the future of the state and the future for the nation, that they have to be the door openers who are going to shepherd students into and through these very important pathways for these very important careers for these very important state and national economic outcomes. So again, there, I think there's an important ideological shift that needs to take place. And we should, um, you know, I think with something like this is always good to give folks tools and models that they could consider. If anyone wants to, to look at what does it look like to do math well for black students, take a look at the, um, the Yamoja program at San Diego City College. And the math faculty is Dr. Rob Rubicala, who does an amazing job with Black students, uh, Yamoja students specifically in math. And so we won't have time to, to unpack all that he does, but go to their website, reach out to him. He's, you know, always happy to talk and, you know, sort of share the things that he's doing. But that would be a good model for Yamoja frying math. This is really a, an, an institutional issue. And as great as Yamoja is, we can't let it exist for years to come as a refuge, right? Like the, the, the classroom doesn't change and they come to Emoja for a refuge. And it has to be more than that. Um, to quote Bettina Love again, we gotta do more than survive. And so if we look at the change that needs to happen in the classroom in math, especially where math isn't just the math, right? Where if it's difficult for people to understand how culturally relevant math can be, we need to help them get there. And we need to make sure that how we hire is indicative of that as well. And so it is a institutional issue, but at the heart of it, and as Dr. Lowe said, it's about care. And as you said, Darla, it's about care. And, 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 and even deeper, it's about humanity. Do you see the humanity of Black people in particular, students of color generally, to where you will change the way you do things because you are affecting the outcomes of their lives. And if you can't do that, you should probably get a different job. But you have to see their humanity and the impact it's gonna have, not just on that particular person, but on us as a community, as a state, as a country. And I'll leave you with, we need to put the community in community college. Well, I think this whole panel was a mic drop. This, uh, you know, obviously we don't rehearse these things, although I know all of these people and I had no doubts, but I think you even exceeded my high expectations to begin with. I thank you all so much on behalf of the ARP group and my whole team uh, putting this together. This is a work of, this is about love, love of, of, of our students and wanting the best uh, for them. We're gonna close out with just a couple of slides because people wanna know, how do I get the report? <laughs> it is on our website, there's a QR code. We'll leave that up. We'll, we can also put a link in the chat. I believe we're ready to, to, to do that as well um, uh, so that you can do it from your computer. I know the QR code is great on your phone, but that is that. Wanna highlight that next week, we're starting a new series here at the RP Group with webinar, webinar series, uh, which is our, kind of our college spotlight. And so, Related to the finding that we shared here about academic probation, we're going to share what Moore Park College has been doing in terms of changing their, their language and their process. So tune in uh, next week. We hope to see you there so we can hear from our colleagues at Moore Park College. Again, the QR code is there for you to register. And then finally, there is another uh, just thank you. Thank everyone here, is the, my team that worked on this is the QR code to the project webpage. And we thank you for, for staying and for your questions. We hope that we were able to answer most of them uh, there in the Q&A. Thanks to our uh, Katie and, and Alyssa for stepping in and helping with that. 
Thanks to everyone.